Assalamu alaikum dear viewers uh, welcome to our segment number 19 as uh, you remember in the last part we had presented to you the earlier part of the Kashmir saga which we called its part one the issue of Kashmir and we shall present that as part number two and then we shall also like to closely bring to you the ceaseless efforts and the meticulous diligence of the qaid -e azam for the state of Pakistan which had been founded and had numerous problems in its early years. The Kashmir Saga part 2 It was obvious to the Qaid the Kashmir question had entered a serious phase which Pakistan could not view with complacency. He as Governor General sent a strongly worded reply to Kashmir which inter alia said the threat to enlist outside assistance shows clearly that the real aim of your government's policy is to seek an opportunity to join the Indian Dominion as a coup d'etat by securing the intervention and assistance of that dominion. This policy is naturally creating deep resentment and grave apprehension among your subjects, 85% of whom are Muslims. The proposal made by my government for a meeting with your accredited representatives is now an urgent necessity. This telegram repeated Pakistan's previous proposal for an impartial inquiry by duly nominated representatives of Pakistan and Kashmir. The Maharaja, however, continued to play his cards according to a set plan. The rot continued and increased in tempo with the infiltration of members of the RSS, the Akali Sikh, and the Indian National Army into Jammu province throughout October. Finally, it culminated with the massacre of two crowded convoys of Muslim evacuees who had been promised a safe conduct to Pakistan. The persecution and the massacre of Muslims forced over 500,000 Muslims to flee Kashmir, to seek shelter in Azad territory and to trek for security into the borders of Pakistan. The motives of the Kashmir state government in prosecuting so disgraceful a campaign of persecution is not difficult to divine. A systematic modification of the population in favor of the non-Muslim elements would obviously achieve popular support for an extension of their own precarious term of office. The tales of merciless butchery that these Kashmiris brought with them eclipsed the terrors of Changiz Khan and has incensed the minds of the volatile Muslim tribesmen. The government of India was busy inciting Hindus of Kashmir and intriguing through them to force the Maharaja to accede to India against the obvious wishes of the overwhelmingly Muslim population of the state who wanted Kashmir to accede to Pakistan. As a part of this conspiracy by India, VP Menon flew into Srinagar on 25th October, inducing the Maharaja to save himself and his dynasty by asking India to rush military aid to Kashmir. But Manon demanded his pound of flesh, namely that Kashmir should accede to India. The Maharaja, who had vacillated over this question for some time, was helped by his pro-Indian Prime Minister and other advisors to accept the offer. Menon, after hopeful talks in Kashmir, returned to Delhi only to fly back to Srinagar. The following day, he came with prepared documents and the weak and panic-stricken Maharaja was forced to sign on the dotted lines. The letter of accession dated 26th October 1947, signed by the Maharaja and addressed to Lord Mountbatten said that Kashmir was contiguous to both India and Pakistan, but it had not acceded to either so far. The letter went on to record the Maharaja's negotiations with both the Dominions for a standstill agreement. The Pakistan government accepted this arrangement. The Dominion of India desired further discussion with the representatives of my government. 
the Maharaja asked for military assistance from India and in return for his anticipated help, the Maharaja wrote, I attach the instruments of accession for acceptance by your government. He asked for immediate assistance. Mr. V.P. Menon is fully aware of the gravity of the situation and will explain it to you. Indian conspiracies, the one that has been explained above, had succeeded and there was jubilation in the Indian capital on the return of Menon with the precious letter safe in his pocket. India's stand on Kashmir was in glaring contrast to what it had maintained with regard to the question of Hyderabad state. Maharaja entered into a standstill agreement with Pakistan. This agreement placed upon Pakistan in respect to Kashmir the same responsibility as were formerly borne by the Crown or the pre-partition government of India. Pari Pasu, because of the standstill agreement between Kashmir and Pakistan, Kashmir was a debarred from having any relations with any country other than Pakistan and b under an obligation to accede to Pakistan. This would render Kashmir's accession to India invalid. On 27th of the same month, Lord Mountbatten sent a cleverly worded letter of acceptance on behalf of the government of India to the Maharaja of Kashmir. In the special circumstances mentioned by your highness, my government have decided to accept the accession of Kashmir state to the dominion of India. The question of accession should be decided in accordance with the wishes of the people of the state. It is my government's wish that as soon as law and order have been restored in Kashmir and its soil cleared of the invader, the question of the state's accession should be settled by a reference to the people. This was a classic move in the realm of deceitful statecraft. The second para commenced with an ominous sentence, which read, Meanwhile, in response to your highness's appeal for military aid, action has been taken today to send troops of the Indian Army to Kashmir to help your own forces to defend your territory and to protect the lives, property and honor of your people. It ended like this, my government and I note with satisfaction that your highness has decided to invite Sheikh Abdullah to form an interim government to work with your prime minister. My dear viewers, much has been written and said in condemnation of the duplicity and treachery of India over the episode of the so-called accession of Kashmir to India. The news of Kashmiri's accession to India came as a shock to Qaid Azam, who was at that time in Lahore on an official visit. He was immediately in consultation with General Gracie in Rawalpindi, who was the Commander-in-Chief of Pakistan's army. At Qaid Azam's suggestion, it was agreed that Lord Mountbatten and Nehru would come to Lahore on 28th October to discuss the Kashmir issue with the Governor-General and the Prime Minister of Pakistan. However, when the Indian cabinet met to ratify the decision, there was general opposition to the Lahore meeting. Strangely, it was given out after the cabinet meeting that Nehru was ill and was not in a position to fly to Lahore. And so Lord Mountbatten reached Lahore alone on 1st November. On the previous day, in order to put the record right, the government of Pakistan issued a statement repudiating the fraudulent and arbitrary action of the Maharaja of Kashmir in signing the instruments of accession with India. Qaid Azam suggested to Mountbatten that both the governors general should issue a joint appeal for cessation of hostilities on both sides within 48 hours. If this was not done, then the two governors general should take upon themselves the administration of Kashmir jointly and the two would then have the responsibility jointly to hold the plebiscite over the question of Kashmir's accession. Mountbatten sulked from this fair and just solution and played for time, saying he would have to consult his cabinet. My dear viewers, Lord Mountbatten met Qaid Azam. The letter accused the government of India as being responsible for the dangerous situation that had arisen in Kashmir. 
and Mountbatten accused Pakistan in this connection. Thus it went on until Jinnah could no longer conceal his anger at what he called Mountbatten's obtuseness. As a weak defense in order to nullify qaid -e azams proposal, Nehru in a broadcast from Delhi on 2nd November said, we are prepared when peace and law and order have been established to have a referendum in Kashmir under international auspices. On 1st January 1948, India decided to refer the Kashmir question to the Security Council under Article 35 of the Charter of the United Nations. The debate opened in the Security Council on 15th January 1948 with Sir Gopal Swami Ayangar arguing the Indian case while Pakistan's spokesman was Sir Zafrullah Khan who presented Pakistan's case in a convincing and forceful manner in a speech that lasted over five hours. On the 20th, the council decided to send out to Kashmir a three-man commission. The commission, however, left for Karachi by plane on 5th July 1948, and when they reached Pakistan, qaid azam was in bad health. Recuperating at Ziyarat, his health went on deteriorating with alarming rapidity, and he could see that when Pakistan needed him so much to handle the Kashmir question and negotiate with United Nations representatives in Pakistan, he, unfortunately, was lying in bed under his doctor's advice, a sick man. But India continues to be in legal occupation of Kashmir, which is in fact a military occupation using a fraudulent accession by an individual as the basis of its usurpation. The brave Kashmiri Muslims continue to groan under the heels of the Indian army, oppressed and persecuted by a government which is not prepared to concede to them their inalienable right of self-determination. The Maharaja of Kashmir, whose anti-Muslim attitude was responsible for the misery and suffering of the citizens of his state, met his nemesis two years after he signed the instruments of accession with India. On 20th June 1949, he was forced to unceremoniously leave his state for Bombay, unwept and unsung. Lord Birdwood comments, having used the ruler conveniently to satisfy legal obligations, India lost interest in his fate. He may not have merited state mourning, but his departure does lend the legality of accession a somewhat artificial appearance. In this matter, again, Kaid's foreboding and subtle warning to Maharaja of Kashmir had come true. Kaid was essentially a true Muslim, humanistic and altruistic, committed to his own mission without malice, vitriol or undue prejudice for anyone, even his worst enemies. Dear viewers, coming now, Qaid's ceaseless and meticulous diligence for the state of Pakistan, despite his very ill health in the last part of his life. Before we recount Qaid's last years of life beset with fatal illness, it would be in order to review what one of his close associates and his most authentic biographer, Mr. G. Elana, wrote about Jinnah's personality, his utmost dedication leading to incredibly long hours of unending labor, all directed towards the sole objective of securing for the Muslims of India a secure homeland of their own. Mr. Arana wrote in the last chapter of Qaid's biography titled qaid -e azam Jinnah, The Story of a Nation, the following. Nature had gifted him with a giant's strength in so far as his determination was concerned to accomplish tasks that he set before himself. But it had clothed that will in a frail body, unable to keep pace with the driving force of his restless mind, he was gifted with a tenaciousness that wanted to triumph over all obstacles to lead his people to their ultimate destiny. 
His political activities and responsibilities had increased manifold during the last 10 years of his life when he was already in the afternoon of his old age. Despite the advice of his doctors, he did not spare himself, refusing to take rest or respite. Work, work and more work. He drained away the last reserves of his energy like a spendthrift child of nature and he plunged himself deeper and deeper into the stormy ocean of political struggle to the utter neglect of his health. Since the Pakistan resolution of 23rd March 1940 at Lahore, he whipped his failing health to make it keep pace with his ever increasing work with a scattered and disorganized following as his only strength. He decided from that year onward to translate the demand of Pakistan into heroic chapter of human history. Incessant traveling, long and arduous hours of work and worries, the only reward that a political leader receives during his days of struggle for taking a heavy toll. But he paid the price with a smile. His five feet, ten and a half inch body that normally weighed around 112 pounds was rapidly losing weight, ounce by ounce. But he showed supreme indifference to such private matters as his personal health. He knew he had a mission in life and fate was transforming him into a man who had a rendezvous with destiny. How could a person, leader of a hundred million people, at a difficult period of their history, enjoy such commonplace luxuries as sleep, rest and leisure? The worries and cares of the day stood on the sidelines of his subconsciousness. They did not completely melt the warmth of a sound sleep. With the approach of dawn came fresh letters, fresh requests, new problems and weighty decisions to be made. He was a soul that thirsted for service in a body that was worn out by overwork and ill health. He kept up this feverish tempo of life for a number of years in spite of his recurring bouts with ill health that emaciated his body. Dear viewers, we have to go back in time a few days when there was feverish activity in Delhi as the dates for the inauguration of Pakistan and Hindustan as independent sovereign countries were drawing near. We take you back to 5th of August 1947 when Lord Mountbatten had a private meeting with Qaeda Azam as the former had received frightening intelligence reports concerning conspiracies to assassinate the Qaeda. The Qaeda, in spite of these lurking attempts on his life, remained unmoved and decided that the state drive on Independence Day would take place as scheduled, being a highly priority state function for that auspicious day. Two days later, Qaeda Azam left Delhi and flew into Karachi, where he was born 71 years ago in order to assume his responsibilities as the first Governor General of Pakistan. Thousands thronged the streets cheering him as the liberator of their nation. Little did they realize his health was in bad shape now, when they needed him so much. Pakistan, for which he had labored unceasingly for many years, had found its place on the map of the world and he was its Governor General designate. Those who watched him that day saw humility in his eyes, not arrogance, a sense of overwhelming responsibility, not elation. On the 11th, the Constituent Assembly of Pakistan met for the first time in Karachi. The atmosphere in the Assembly Hall surcharged with solemnity and the proceedings commenced with a recitation from the Holy Quran. The very first enactment of the Constituent Assembly was to unanimously elect Muhammad Ali Jinnah as its president, the motion being carried with thunderous applause. A hushed silence descended in the hall as a Qaeda rose to deliver his presidential address. After expressing his thanks, he said the Constituent Assembly had two main functions to perform. The first is a very onerous and responsible task of framing our future constitution of Pakistan and the second 
of functioning as a full and complete sovereign body as the federal legislature of Pakistan. About the creation of Pakistan as a nation state, he said, it has been unprecedented. There is no parallel in the history of the world. He condemned bribery and corruption from which India had suffered. That really is a poison. You must put it down with an iron hand. Black marketing is another curse. He branded nepotism and jobbery as obnoxious evils. This evil must be crushed relentlessly. I shall never tolerate any kind of jobbery, nepotism or any influence directly or indirectly brought to bear upon me. Speaking of religious tolerance, he said, you are free, you are free to go to your temples. You are free to go to your mosques or to any other places of worship in the state of Pakistan. He solemnly pledged he would remain above prejudice or ill will, partiality or favoritism. I shall always be guided by the principles of justice and fair play. Dear viewers, Jinnah's trusted lieutenant Nawab Zada Liaqat Ali Khan rose to move a resolution that the Constituent Assembly in gratitude for Jinnah's services to the nation and in order to make articulate the wishes of the people confers upon Muhammad Ali Jinnah the title of qaid azam a title which the Muslims of India had lovingly bestowed on him during the anxious years before partition. In commending the resolution for acceptance, Lakat Ali Khan called the Qaid the Ataturk or Stalin of our state. The resolution was unanimously adopted. The Muslim League had adopted as its flag a green banner with a crescent in the center. Constituent Assembly decided in commemoration of the years of struggle by their political organization to adopt the same as the flag of Pakistan with only one modification, adding a white strip near the mast to denote the minorities of Pakistan. Lord Mountbatten flew into Karachi from Delhi on the morning of 13th August to formally participate in the inauguration of the state of Pakistan and that was to be his last official duty as a viceroy of British India. That night the Qaid entertained Lord Mountbatten to a state banquet. During the course of his speech the Qaid said for His Majesty the King this is one of the most momentous and unique occasions. Today we are on the eve of complete transfer of power to the peoples of India and there will emerge and establish two independent sovereign dominions of Pakistan and Hindustan on the appointed day, the 15th of August 1947. Such voluntary and absolute transfer of power and rule by one nation over others is unknown in the whole history of the world. The Qaid paid fulsome tribute to the role played by Lord Mountbatten in the drama of the transfer of power to Pakistan and Hindustan. As one who performed his task and duties magnificently, on Thursday, 14th August 1947, Qaeda Azam, accompanied by Miss Fatma Jana, drove in state to the assembly building for the official ceremonies, where Lord Mountbatten was to make the historic statement with which would synchronize the birth of Pakistan. Lord and Lady Mountbatten followed after a little while. The compound of the assembly building was jam-packed. So were the streets from where the state drive was to take place. Hundreds of spectators sitting perilously in vantage positions all along the route, some dangling from roofs like bats from trees. The official ceremonies were impressive in keeping with the historic occasion. After the ceremonies terminated, the Qaid and Mountbatten were sitting together in the coach going back in state to the Governor General's house. There had been so much talk among those that knew about an attempt that was expected to be made on the Qaid's life on this occasion. Qaid Azam was fully aware of the grave risk involved, but he refused to be persuaded to abandon 
the state drive, which was an integral part of the official schedule. Slowly, the procession proceeded, every second pregnant with anxiety. The coach was now inside the gates of the Governor General's house. Nothing untoward had happened on the way. And Campbell Johnson records in his diary that Kaid said to Mountbatten, Thank God I have brought you back alive. His private secretary, Mr. S.M. Yusuf, gave in an article in the dawn intimate glimpses of the dedicated manner in which Kaid discharged his duties as the first Governor General of Pakistan in those difficult days. Yusuf writes, the law department of the government of Pakistan did not have a sufficient number of trained draftsmen and the drafting of some of the bills and ordinances left a lot to be desired. The Qaeda would not be content to agree in principle to a piece of legislation. He would carefully scan every line and word of the proposed legislation as he had a wholesome aversion to signing a document the full implications of which were not known to him. The Qaed, according to Yusuf, wanted the administration to be alert and they should not expect me, that is the Qaed Azam, to come to their rescue if they delay matters without adequate cause was what the Qaed had said. Yusuf records, sickness and failing health did not deter the Qaed Azam from attending to his duty. He went on working to the very last and continued to deal with important state papers until his death. This is corroborated by Farooq Hameen, also on his secretariat staff. The Qaeda Azam, he said, never rested a moment after he became Governor General. And he literally worked himself to death. On 15th August 1947 was published the first issue of the Gazette of Pakistan. And Pakistan was now officially set on its course as an independent sovereign state. Whereas Qaeda Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah has been appointed by His Majesty to be the Governor General of Pakistan, the said appointment is hereby notified and it is proclaimed that he, the said Governor General of Pakistan has this day assumed his office. That same gazette contained a further notification. His Excellency the Governor General has been pleased to appoint Mr. Lakat Ali Khan, Mr. I. I. Chundrigar, Mr. Ghulam Muhammad, Sardar Abdurab Nishtar, Mr. Ghazanfar Ali Khan, Mr. Jogindra Nath Mandal, Mr. Fadlur Rahman to be ministers of the government of Pakistan. Hindu intrigues were actively undermining the economic fabric of Pakistan even before it came into existence. Trade and industry in that part of India, which became Pakistan, was almost exclusively in the hands of the Hindus. In the words of a Hindu banker, after us, the deluge, we are leaving Pakistan an economic desert. He had said very gleefully, that epitomizes the wishful thinking of Hindus who began to migrate to India in their thousands after the establishment of Pakistan. Dear viewers, I'm sure that uh, with this segment's presentation, you would have understood as to how Pakistan came into existence with all the difficulties that Jinnah Sahib had to face despite his ill health and the machinations of the British government and Mr. Mountbatten as well as the Congress party. But Pakistan is here to stay because it was established by a person no less than I would call an angel sent to us by God Almighty who was named Jinnah, Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Thank you.